Hallelujah. I want to speak to you from three, in three facets. What I believe God showed me. We're going to, in two weeks time, Saturday in a week's time, we're going to present a subject blueprint. That's all about the foundation of what we believe as a ministry. That is like a six hour course and maybe today by miracle in a half an hour, I want to run through some of it just to give you an overview and that you will check in your heart. Do you need to come and make sure that you are founded in accurate teaching? Uh, that you will please come and do that. Those who want to become members, that's actually what we want you to do. Will two or more agree to walk together if they didn't agree? Hello. Agreeing before the walking is very important. Amen. But 2 Kings 13, I want to start there. Uh, that's totally in a different place. A uh, word that God gave me, I believe, for today. And this is about the death of uh, Elijah. don't know if it's very encouraging, but on the one side, maybe. Verse 14, now Elisha had been suffering from the illness from which he died. The king of Israel went down to see him and wept over him. My father, my father, he cried, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. Here's the king and he calls the prophet, my father, my father. What are we talking about? My brother, my sister, there's generational blessings, there's generational destiny, there's generational calling in unique destinies that God has for generations. But spiritual fathering in that context is very important. Is it not when Elijah went to heaven that Elisha said, my father, my father, please, I'm not saying please go and call people my father, my father. Uh, <clears throat> but there was such a relationship in a spiritual sense between Elijah and Elisha that as a spiritual son, the double anointing, the double portion of his spirit was put on Elijah. And that is part of the legacy between father and son. And when you come into spiritual fathering and you come into spiritual sonship, you know it's just being an ambassador of a divine pattern in the Trinity. Because in the Trinity there's father and son, but you won't believe it. You believe it. Yeah. That the son is as much God as the father is God. But they position themselves as father and son. So when you get into spiritual sonship relationship, it's not like you are so much less than the spiritual father. Not at all. Father-son relationship at the, is a dynamic where you become an ambassador of that dynamic. But interesting, so Elijah, Elisha, and Elisha, 14 miracles recorded. Elijah, 7 miracles recorded. The next generation, there's a quickening anointing that you will accomplish so much more, such, so much quicker. That is what's supposed to happen. So Elijah, Elisha, and Elisha, and even here, the king. That is the spiritual son of the prophet. It's not about your position. It's about, and do you understand legacy transfer? Do you understand this generational God where the promises of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob is yours if you understand how to honor accurately? You know, you find the, the fake ten rand and the true ten rand. We talked about that. So the fake ten rand is where the fake ten rand can work because there's a real ten rand. So you can get away with the fake ten rand a lot. So the fake ten rand, one of the, one of those, are like ancestral worship, where we can get the counsel from the ancestors. Now that in the Old Testament, they did it, and God says they they are cursed because they are asking the counsel of the dead, and that's wrong. But there's a true principle, and that is you must learn from the testimony, you must learn from the wisdom of the older people. Are you with me? So in your generations, your grandfather's grandfather's grandfather that made a hell of a mess of his life. He didn't cut off the generational destiny, legacy, blessing that God has for you. Because there's grandmothers and their grandmothers and grandmothers. There's in your generations some ladies that really prayed and they saw nothing. But it's there in the spirit. And when you understand, honor. 
then on earth, in your life, it will be as it is in heaven. And even as it is prayed for in generations and generations and generations and generations, it can happen in your life. Hello? Is it not a, a father like David? He had all the fights with the Philistines. Remember we spoke about it? He had all the fights. But his son, not the son who tried to take the throne. Not an Absalom. But a Solomon who understood how to honor. He just received the benefit from the fighting. He doesn't have to face the Goliath because the father really faced the Goliath. You need to face the Goliath. Our generation need to face the Goliath so that the children can move into the next level of what God has for them. But let's compromise. Don't, let's not face the giants. And the giants will get little Goliathikis. And they, and they will rise up a lot of giants. Oh, it's, dumb. it's so rough. But the old men had no wisdom. The previous generation didn't know how to walk with the wisdom of God. But for the end time, in a time even as this, the Holy Spirit will be given. And Joel 2, the prophecy was not like Peter explained on the day of Pentecost for that day. But also more to the end of days, it will happen. That when the Spirit of God will be poured out upon all flesh. The flesh that's not foolish, but the flesh that came to know the word. What will come out is what they've put in. And the children, the children of God, who filled them with the word. And the spirit will come over you. The word of God will just come over you. And they will be a new generation. They will be a generation rising up. Kids that will enter the kingdom as a child. They will just know how to enter the kingdom. But in the spirit, may you become that type of generation. That as a child of not reasoning, not first want to understand everything, but just childlike faith, innocent faith, just to step out in faith. Yes, the spirit will be poured out on all flesh and from your mouth will come the word of God. But the young men, they see the vision. They want to go, they want to go. Yes, that's uh, Joshua, the battle of Joshua out in the, in the field. Moses is with his hands up there with the blessing of God. He has a different perspective. And that is, the old men will dream dreams. That's not because they have nothing else to do. The concept is, the wisdom will be there. Wisdom is to see the bigger picture, the dream. What is the dream that God has for Bloemfontein? The dream for that school, the dream for this nation, the dream for the nations, the dream for this church. We need the wisdom of God to understand the dream. To understand the dream, we need the wisdom of God. But there's a wisdom that the world will give that's foolishness with God. And there's a wisdom through the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit will be poured out, a wisdom will rise through dreams from the mature. May you get God's perspective when the Spirit is coming over you more and more and more into the season of total shaking, shaking, shaking in the nations. That there will come a wisdom from the mature in the church of understanding the dream. But the other young men, that will, they will not fall, but they will have the guts to rise by faith. Faith from hearing, hearing from the word because the young men got into the word they will have the faith they will not faith as a reaction i better try to do something now no they will not react on what's happening in the world they will react on the word and they will see the vision they will see the vision not as a reaction to what the world is doing but as an action based on the holy spirit working in them that's you, my brother, my sister. Where if we grow up, if we mature, but then still every day, let it be so that you eat the word as a little child. So that when the spirit is upon you, you will prophesy. Prophesy means you are saying exactly what God is saying. And it's encouraging. Essence of prophecy is encouraging. But the foundation of prophecies is the accurate word. It's the accurate word. You will pray with accuracy through the word. You will pray that what will not return void to God because his word will never return void. 
When the Spirit of God is on you and you've learned how to walk in the Spirit and how to allow and how to respect the Spirit of God on you, what you will pray according to the Word, it will be there. It will not return void. Your prayer will not return void. Back to Him. Come on, let's have that faith. Let's have that purpose. Because when you position yourself ready with the Word in you, Ready with a vision from the word. Ready with a wisdom to, to dream the dream through the word. Then the Holy Spirit can just be poured out on your life. And you will open into your destiny. It will open up. May you be in that place. Amen. Amen. Okay, so Elisha said, get a bow and some arrows. And he did so. I mean, for what reason? There's no enemy here. Come on. I mean, Elisha, you are dying. I'm acknowledging you as my spiritual father, my father, my father. There you're going and you tell me to get some bow and arrows. What on earth? Take the bow in your hands, he said to the king of Israel. When he had taken it, Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. His hands on the king's hands. My brother, my sister, it's supposed to be God's hand on your hand. God's hand on your hand. Are you with me? Open the east window, he said. And he opened it. Shoot. And he shot. And Elisha said, the Lord's arrow of victory. The arrow of victory over the enemy. Over the enemy. The arrows coming from your mouth, from your heart, from your faith, from the word, what you declare. Open the windows. Open the windows of your life and shoot out those arrows in prayer, in what you speak, in how you, what you say about politics, what you say about the city, what you say about the economy, about your finances, about your challenges, about your success, about your failures. What you say, it must be an arrow of victory. That the arrow, what you speak, is victory for God's nation. Huyamore, are you here? The arrow of victory for the Lord. You open your mouth and you talk about politics. Those demonic forces holding the people bondage in that area. They say, oh, he's opening his mouth. There's arrows coming. There's arrows of victory for the Lord coming our way. When that man opens his mouth. When that lady opens her mouth. She's not going to honor She's not going to honor the arrows of irritation and depression or negativity or, or frustration or, or the circumstances. Just all about herself and what she goes through and what she doesn't go through. No. It's not, a, it's not a comedy to look at. The devil stole one another. When that lady opens her mouth, you better run. The arrows of God's victory is coming our way. And your circumstance will fall in line for God's purposes. Circumstance don't necessarily change for our perspective of our favor, how we want it to be changed. But your circumstance, your provision, your so-called lack of provision, it will align for the perfect purposes of God and the perfect destiny and dream that God has for your life. It will align for that. The Lord is your shepherd. You shall have no need. You shall not want. You will have everything, everything, everything you need to fulfill your purpose. Not, how do they say? Your needs, not your greeds. Eh? Unless we get into manipulative prayer. That, uh, that in any case doesn't work. May God help you. May God help me. Arrow of victory. Then he said, take the arrows. And the king took them. Elisha told them, strike the ground. He struck it three times and stopped. The man of God was angry with him. Come on, man. Here's the king acknowledging with respect Elisha as his spiritual father. And here is he, he's doing exactly what the prophet is saying. But the prophet didn't tell him he must strike the ground more than three times. Now this man is getting angry. It's time to take offense, you know, and... Stand on your right and your wrong. He doesn't take offense, but he hear what he's saying. You should have. 
struck the ground five or six times, then you would have defeated the enemy completely and completely destroyed it. But now you will have, you will defeat it only three times. That sounds so unfair, man. Just because he struck it three times, now he's only going to defeat the enemy three times. And then they will have trouble again. With what God has given you, go with it in with a passion. It's not just doing, and I think I'm doing all the right things so that I'm not in trouble. I must do it right, otherwise I'm in trouble. Do it like that, and you will have some victory, but further the enemy must come against you, and you will have struggle, and you must have struggle, and you must have struggle. That's the situation here. God must help me, and he must help you. But when you obey with passion, when the, God is giving you the initiative and you put your everything in, I'm not talking about like Peter saying, hey, let's build three huts here on the mountain for Jesus, Moses and Elijah. I'm not talking about that type of initiative. I'm talking about you are passionate into God's will. Even if it's not so lacquer always. Even if it's sometimes sacrifice, you put your passion in it because you see that it's an honor to do it for God. It's a privilege to obey Him. It's a privilege to love Him with not, no cheap fake love, but a real love that is, has one major ingredient in, and it's obedience. If you love me, you will obey. That's not a manipulation sentence. That works when you try it with your wife. If you love me, you'll bring me breakfast in bed. Oh, it will not work. She normally sees it as a joke. Can you believe it? Okay, what am I saying? If you love me, you'll obey. God says, if you have this kind of love, the proof will be in the pudding. If you have this kind of love, it will have the quality of obedience in it. It's not manipulative. If you love me, then you will do this. It says, if you have my kind of love in you, it will be with obedience as an ingredient. It will no, be no cheap, cheap love. Now what I'm saying, what you do, do it with a passion. Not to do the right thing so that I'm not in trouble. You work somewhere, you're supposed to do it for the Lord. You are on time so that you're not in trouble. Okay. Shoot some arrows, but you will, that trouble will come. But put some passion in it so that you don't just strike the ground three times. You put your everything in it. You put your everything with a passion to be driven by love, led by peace, with joy of the Lord as strength. And put that in it. Hello? And you will have victory upon victory and we can walk into that victory because the church of christ is going to rise like never before and there will be a church that rises that will become a two ways about him and not about us there will be a bride that will focus on the bridegroom and have a longing for the bridegroom a bride that is not focused and have a desire for her circumstances to change but who is waiting for the ex with an expectation for the revealing of the son of god the bridegroom. That type of church is going to rise up. Yes, legal and religious church will rise up also. And the curse, curse, curse of religion will come in more and, and will have a lot of authority in a lot of places. But among, through God's grace, may we be part of it, by God's grace only, to rise up, to become the bride that is not consumed with herself. The word says she's beautifying herself for him. Not beautifying herself to be beautiful and to enjoy her own beauty. Yes, maybe so that she enjoys what she sees, what God is doing in her. Ah, hello, are you with me? I'm going all around, but the focus in that. A mature bride. Where she has one desire, and that is the coming of the bridegroom. There will be a church that will rise up and become mature into that level. Please, by God's grace, let us be part of it. There's a king, 
they oppressed Israel and did a lot of stuff. Verse 23 of 2 Kings 13. But the Lord was gracious to them and had compassion and showed concern for them because of his covenant with Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. Because of God's covenant with your spiritual father way back. Abram. Father Abram has many sons. You remember that song? I don't know how you sang that in Sutu. But in any case, Father Abraham, many sons. And from that spiritual father, way back, because of God's covenant with him, it can be grace on you. If you understand how to honor the generational blessing. And I'm not going to say that again. Blessing is not all the goodies. Blessing is to have the capacity to obey. Blessing is to understand eternal value. Blessing is to worship Him in spirit and truth. Oh man, let's get the right definition of blessing. But, are you with me? Are you with me? Please, man. Because of His covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and promises, and for thousands of generations, where some aunties and some men lay down their lives, so it will happen for you when you honor that you will have the impact of what they prayed for david had the fight solomon he had a different calling but there was no enemy no philistines no goliaths he could focus on building the temple for the lord and the palace for himself and be trained in the wisdom of god that the world came to him for the wisdom that he revealed that was his calling he he had a different calling so your children, the next generation, they must not go and work through everything that you are working through. Because we were too lazy to get out of Egypt and to follow Moses and obey him and moan and groan in the desert. Now for 40 years, Caleb and Joshua and the kids must also for another 40 years work and walk through the desert because the generation was like moaning and groaning. They didn't find themselves in Christ. They found themselves in the moaning and the groaning. And we can so easily, in the past, not anymore, articulate all the moaning and the groaning and tell you what I'm frustrated about and what I feel and why I feel this and why I have this opinion or that opinion. Oh, let's, let's be quiet about that a little bit more. And he say, God, help me so that from my lip they will come truth. I'm not saying you're just speaking scripture the whole day. But when you have the foundation of truth, what you will build on it will be truth will be truth don't build an excellent house and when the storm comes it will fall because it's built on sand don't be deceived are you with me i had a spiritual father yes and uh, there's a lot of things what they went through what they fought for we just received i remember doing for malted and some of those those guys and they had hatfield they went through such a lot of trouble because they believed the gifts of the Spirit can work today. You can speak in tongues. You can pray in tongues. You can, and they had trouble. Some of them were businessmen, and the business, they will cut them out of the business. They, they had to suffer, if I must say like that, and lay down their lives just to believe you can speak in tongues. But they had the fight. And today... You want to speak in tongues, come to somebody, they pray for you and you speak in tongues and you go on. And then even when we sing in tongues, uh, not you guys, other people, you know, they don't even push to pray in tongues. You have the gift and God says that you're supposed to sing in the spirit and pray with understanding. Pray with understanding, pray in the spirit, sing in the spirit, sing with understanding. That singing in tongues, singing Afrikaans, English, Swahili, Sutu, Zulu. Are you with me? Good morning. What they went through, just in a quickening anointing, you just receive it. Hopefully we are giving ourselves for our next foundation. So that our kids, so that the next generation just, just walk through. They have only one thing that they must remember. They must honor you. 
And they must be thankful how you lay down your life for such a new progressive revelation that you were willing to lay down your life for that so that it can, can become a foundation for the next generation just to build further into maturity. Give your life to Christ, wonderful. But what make you so great to understand that at a time the church you need to go and pay to be forgiven. You need to pay some money, some gold, something to be forgiven. And then Martin, Martin, Martin Luther and Calvin, not Calvin Klein, other guy. And a lot of guys stood up and said, no, you are saved only by grace through the blood of Christ and Jesus on the cross. There's no paying of these priests and these guys a lot of money so that they didn't say, no, you are forgiven. That's rubbish. Some of them were martyred. Some of them were slaughtered. But they gave their lives for that so that today we can just... Hallelujah, I'm saved. I gave my life to Christ. Just pray a prayer. And I'm not talking about cheap prayer. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. Come and re give you the rebirth. Yes. But are you grateful? Are you honoring the generations that lay down their lives so that you can have the legacy, the gold of just understanding certain things through the Word? Just have it. But as long as the enemy can get you in a place of not gratitude, not having gratitude, not being thankful, because that accompanies the honoring of previous generations. You cannot call up spirits. They, they did it in the Old Testament, New Testament. Well, if you want to try and call up something, it will only be demons that manifest as if it is that, that guy. Old Testament, no, it was a different ball game. The guys, they wanted to put the, the, the dead guy in the graveyard and then some thieves came and they got a fright and they threw him in. The prophet's grave, what happened? You remember? The guy came alive because of the anointing that was still even on the dead bones. <laughs> I think those guys got a fright of their lives. They had a story for their wives that evening that they didn't believe. How they just put their guy there in the grave and that the bones of the prophet <laughs> was there. And the next moment this guy rose from the dead. Ah, what I'm saying may you have a legacy because of the anointing of God on your life the spirit of the Lord God is upon you Isaiah 61 because of what? so that you have a wonderful life no, because he has anointed you for a purpose his hand is on you for a purpose let's say God's hand is on me for a purpose why will you not run in your purpose if you don't respect the hand of God don't tell me oh I know I must find my person Repent first of all for the fact that you don't respect his hand on your life. Because if a father or mother take the hand of the child and wants to move the child, realize, I need to move with dad now. Hello? And if he doesn't have it, it's a struggle or a tantrum. And sometimes we can go through the tantrum of the struggle of, I need to lay down my life, I need to go there, but I want to go there. His hand is on you because you're supposed to go somewhere with him. He has anointed you for a purpose. For a purpose. Find that with God. Please, please, my brother, my sister, find that. Okay, that was the introduction, but we're going to have faith. Then it will be quick. Okay, so in the course of six, seven hours, next Saturday, it's all about the five, certain five foundations. That's not the only foundations, but that we deal with what we believe God said we must have as a church. First of all, is baptism in Christ. Then baptism in water. Baptism in the Holy Spirit. Accurate relationships in the body of Christ. And accurate destiny. Understanding your destiny, your calling. Five foundations. First of all, my brother, my sister, you need to know who you are in Christ. Romans 6, I'm, I'm running through it. Go and look there. He says, must we, because of the grace, can, must we stay in sin? And he says, definitely not. Definitely not. We can just not stay in sin. Because what? When we were baptized, we were baptized in Christ. And it's not water baptism. 
You were baptized in Christ when you gave your life to Christ. You became a member of the body. You gave your, your life to Christ. You're not on your way to hell. You were called out of darkness into his marvelous light. And into his marvelous light is in Jesus Christ the light. Called into who he is. What does the word say? Galatians 2.20. We are crucified with Christ. And we died with him. And then in Romans 6 he says you died in him. And you were buried with Christ and in Christ. And you were raised with him and through him and in him. And you are now seated with Christ in heavenly places. Remember? We talked about that? Oh no, no, please give me a little bit more or something like Tupperware face. <laughs> Hello, are you there? <laughs> so what am I saying? My brother, my sister, this process, give my life to him, I identify with him, I no longer live, he's living in me and through me, because with Christ, crucified, died with Christ, buried with Christ, raised with Christ, seated with Christ in heavenly places. And then if I have a life, where I find the life, the word says, your life is hidden in Christ. God has an excellent life for you, but it is hidden. He's not just going to give it to you on a plate. The word says, seek him, seek him. When you seek him, at least then you can seek and, and find in him the life that he dreamt about for you. The dream is in his heart. The dream for your life is not in your heart, first of all, it's in his heart. If you don't come to know his heart, how on earth would you think will you come to know the dream that is in his heart for you? Your life is hidden in Christ, but through the word and the spirit it can be revealed to you. But that is a journey. Of frustration or a journey to enjoy with the Holy Spirit. I repent, I hope you also. That is not a journey of frustration. Well, I'm not just in the office to find out the will of God to walk out there and to go and do, but to sit with Him, commune with Him, enjoy with Him, heart to heart. Gesels met God and I will meet you, Gesels. Amen. What's Gesels in English? Chat sounds so very. Have a converse, uh, conversation, converse with the Lord. Yeah, have fellowship. It's like fellowship with the Lord, you know? Enjoy the presence. Where are we now? Okay, in Christ. So, when you gave your life to Christ, you are baptized in Christ. And then, baptism, baptism in water, the second hour in the course, what you will do, and talk about many guys, ish, ish. Even the charismatic and Pentecostal perspective, you will hear some stuff that's actually not accurate in that line. Like you are baptized in Christ and they put some of these scriptures like Romans 6 with your baptism. You cannot put it with your water baptism. I'm here today to lay down my old life and be washed clean. Through what? Through some magic water. That's not going to happen. You laid down your life and you were washed clean by the blood of Jesus when you gave your life to Christ through the water. You just testify with the water from the municipality that is there in, that, in there. With that water, you just testify that you were washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. You know there to lay down your old life and to be washed clean by the dam water. It's water in a dam. Water and uh, or water from the tap. Are you with me? <laughs> Hallelujah. Just get yourself in line. So the water baptism is a testimony. Are you with me? So first of all, you testify of how you were baptized in Christ. That's why you are baptized in water. Not be sprinkled. Uh, what's that thing? Uh, what's besprinkeling? That thing. Not the sprinkling. Of water there Calvin he he did was a powerful man of God he laid a lot of foundations but he wasn't God he was a man and he made make mistakes there's things that we will pioneer but hopefully the next generation will see our mistakes so that they will not crash with it 
Hello? So as a man, he, there are certain things that he said with it was not right. Where he said, one thing he said was, even though the word baptism means immersion, and even though that was the practice of the early church, he said, do I feel that the way of baptism is not so important? How can I say, this is what the word says, this is what the church did, but I feel we can do it this way. Oh, I don't have the authority to do that. Are you with me? Infant baptism, it's no baptism. It's based on three scriptures. What, what is used, and don't you judge them. Three scriptures, but it's ic uh, religious ignorance. That, first of all, oh, how can you hinder the babies to come, the children to come to God? You cannot hinder them to be baptized. No, that's, that's nonsense. Jesus didn't say, bring the children to me, and he baptized them. No, he, he, he took them and he blessed them. Not baptize them. Let's stay accurate. And the second thing was Acts 2. Repent. First, first, first sermon after Pentecost. Repent. Be baptized. Repent. And after repentance, be baptized. Not repent and be baptized you and all your children and babies. No. You repent and you are baptized. And then forgiveness of sin. Gift of the Holy Spirit. And this promise is for you and your children and for those who are far off. So they call it the promise in baptism. You cannot, because God promised it to your child, that's why you baptize the child because of the promise. No. No, the promise was there if they also would repent. If they also are baptized, they will also receive the following. If there's a promise that if you go, go to shell. Give them 10 rand and you will receive a Ferrari. This promise is for you and your children, I tell you. And if I say that's also for your children, then it doesn't mean they just sit here and somebody must bring for them also a Ferrari. No, no, no. The promise is they, if they also go there and pay 10 rand, then they will get the Ferrari. If they also repent and are baptized, they will surely also be forgiven and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So you, we cannot manipulate that one. And the last one that they stand on is baptism in the place of circumcision. And circumcision, you, they, they circumcise the babies. New Testament, they baptize the babies. No. Circumcision not in the place. Oh, baptism not in the place of circumcision. Okay, so what is in the place of circumcision? Circumcision was the sign of the old covenant. Now, in, in, in Pentecostal circles, sometimes people say, heart circumcision is in the place of physical circumcision. I don't know, some of you guys maybe heard that before. That heart circumcision in the New Testament, that's in the place of the physical circumcision. That's also not true. Because circumcision of the heart was expected. You will find it many, many times in Deuteronomy. God says you must be circumcised to the point of your heart also. And then through the prophets, many times people were sent in, in uh, exile, in exile, balance cup, in exile because the prophet says, because you are circumcised but you are uncircumcised. Because your hearts are not circumcised. I call you uncircumcised, God says. So he expected them to be circumcised. In the Old Testament, you tell me Moses and David not circumcised. Oh, man, they were circumcised maybe more than us altogether in the hearts. But we're going to get there in Jesus' name. Are you with me? So then what? The blood sign in the Old Covenant circumcision is appealing and challenging the heart to be circumcised. The blood sign of the covenant, the cross of Christ. New Testament sign of the covenant, the cross of Christ, is appealing, is challenging you. It will be a foundation or it will be a stumbling block in your life. You will stumble over the message of the cross or it will become a foundation in your life. Just like seek circumcision through the blood, making an appeal on your flesh to be cut off. Cross, make an appeal to your flesh to be crucified with Christ. This is God's initiative through a blood covenant sign. Oh, in the Bible, no comparison between 
baptism and circumcision. So the one cannot be in the place of the other one. But how many times the cross is compared with circumcision? Paul says, if I speak the message of circumcision, if I still speak the message of circumcision, I became a stumbling block for the cross. Because the cross has a message. The word says, message of the cross is the power of God unto salvation. I know you all know this stuff, but bear with me. Are you with me? Message of the cross. But if I preach the circumcision, the message of circumcision, I'm a stumbling block for the cross. Hello. Paul says in uh, Galatians 6, there's many guys, they, they, they boast in how they are circumcised in the flesh. They boast in their religion. But me, verse 14, I will boast in nothing else except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The whole time, the comparison there. Through circumcision, you, he told the guys, the church, through circumcision, you were left out as heathens and the Jews there. But then Jesus came, he did this, he did that, he did that, he did that, and he took away the dividing wall through the cross. This one verse where he says it, just like that. My brother, my sister, understand, there's no infant baptism in the place of circumcision. It's the cross of Christ. And the cross says, you better be crucified with Christ. Circumcision says, in the Old Testament, you better be a heart circumcised. Are uh, we with one another? Last example, let me finishing off. Of a lot that I would want, would have wanted to do, but I please, I, I, I plead with you, come and do the five hour course. You even get a Buddhist roll for free. You won't believe it. Just edit that out. <laughs> what, what am I saying? Talking nonsense, forgive me. Okay, so all I want to say, there's one example still in Corinthians that Paul gave the Corinthians. He said, you were all, when you came from Egypt, you were baptized in Moses. You were baptized in the Red Sea. You were baptized in the clouds. You can be in your Egypt, my brother, but if you are not baptized in Christ the Savior, you will not get out of Egypt. If you don't follow the one that you are baptized in. Moses came like a savior. And he spoke the word. And those, the Israelites who believed him. They, they had to believe him. Because I mean, I can go be, uh, behind Moses. But what if those guys just come and slaughter me? So they made a choice. They made a choice to follow Moses also. Are you with me? You can see the works of God. You can have testimony about the works of God. They saw the power of God manifest through Moses. But Moses was like a savior. They were baptized in Moses. So you find yourself in Christ because you believe in Christ. You believe in his love for you. Okay? Baptized in Christ, baptized in Moses. Baptism in the Red Sea, that's obvious. That's baptism in water. Are you with me? Are you with me? Now, as they went through, this magical water <laughs> just drowned all the Egyptians. But it's not magical in your life. The magic or the power of God in it is obedience. Obey God. You gave your life to Christ. The first thing God asks you is testify about what happened in you through baptism. Testify. Let everybody know you are not part of Egypt anymore. You're not part of Egypt anymore. Let that testimony be there. Are you with me? So your past is gone. Your past is gone. And then there's one verse. 1 Peter 3 verse 21. When I had to be baptized, oh, those days it was, was rough, 35 years ago. I don't know if some people were baptized 30 years ago or 35 years ago. Yo, yo, yo. And I was at the farm. My uncle, my Grandpa, grandma, all the family there, and a professor from the theological school, he, he preached. So afterwards, sitting there at home, after we had a meal and everybody's there, so he said, uh, so Cornelius, I hear that you broke your covenant with God. 
And, uh, but then at that stage, I saw a lot of just politics about this type of thing. So I just said, Professor, not that I know of. <laughs> but that's because I was baptized. And I called my infant baptism that is not a baptism. But in those days, it was rough. Today, not so much. But may God guide you and help you to stand to stand in obedience with him. Amen. Are you with me? But uh, then my father and mother said, um, I want you to speak to a few dominies and to few professors. And then if you still want to be baptized, it's okay. And I just felt I must honor them in that. God gave me a release. So I went to speak uh, to a lot of them. And I thought one question I would ask the professors. If baptism is only God to man, then we can baptize the baby. Yes. If baptism is man unto God, then we cannot baptize the baby. Then the professor says, yes, all of them. I said, now why? One time I was a little bit arrogant. I told him, why is Peter in the Bible so deceived? <laughs> well, that was wrong. That 1 Peter 3, 21 says, the baptism is a pledge unto, unto God. For a clear conscience. Oh, that baby has a very bad conscience about some stuff that he did. Oh, rubbish. So baptism is a pledge unto God for a clear conscience. And then they had no answers. Not one of them had even a half an answer. But what I'm saying is be accurate in what you believe. Not to judge others, but to be accountable in what you stand for. Please, please, you're not called to judge others in Jesus' name. So, a place for a clear conscience, like the Egyptians of the past, like these Egyptians of the past, made slaves of Israel. So your past can make slaves of you. But through the baptism, understand, no, no, no. I followed Moses. I followed Jesus Christ even through baptism. And my past is gone. That is forsake in the Red Sea. It is forsake. It is uh, drowned. It drowned in the Red Sea. So your past is gone. It has no breath for a voice. Let's say my past has no breath to have a voice. Those who didn't say that, uh, repent and then believe it and then say it. Thank you. Okay, so what are we saying? Your past cannot haunt you. Those Egyptians, they are finished. It's finished. Because you were baptized in Moses and you obeyed through the Red Sea. And then what is the whole thing? Last in, baptized in the cloud. And we all know what that stands for. Baptism in Holy Spirit. Baptized in Christ, baptized in water, baptism in the Holy Spirit. That's it. So, only thing that I say further with that... You know, when it was desert and it was hot and it was hell in, this, in, the, in, the, in the desert, it was the cloud of his presence. When you're going through circumstance, and circumstance not necessarily going to change, be aware of his presence over your life. Be aware of his presence over your life. In the night when it's too cold, it will be the fire. In the day when it's very hot, it will be the cloud. But the Holy Spirit will give you the breakthroughs. You go with Holy Spirit, even if it's long, maybe if it's many times through the desert. Here, these guys, because of a lot of arrogance, a lot of moaning and groaning, must go another 40 years. But you know, for each one of those 40 years, every day, day and night, the cloud, the fire was faithfully there. Every, every time. Doesn't matter what you go through. God's presence will be there. Amen. God, Teach us your ways. But God, help us to appreciate your grace over our lives. God, that you will never leave us, never forsake us. Even if we must go through the desert, God, you are there. We must go. And it's cold. If it's hot, you will be there. Through the fire, you will be there. With your, the cloud of glory. Help every man, every woman in this place to find who you are. God, that they will find their lives in you, a life that is hidden, that you dreamt about for every man and woman in this place. Holy Spirit, come and open it up as they choose to get into your word. 
to spend time with you, Lord, that from that place they will come to find themselves so that their identity will determine their destiny. Help them to find their identity so that they will run into accurate destiny. God, if there's somebody here that must still be baptized, I pray that you will speak to them through the Holy Spirit, that you don't feel condemned, but they will be, you will bring the conviction in their hearts. Holy Spirit, thank you. And those who need to be baptized in the Spirit, even with the speaking in tongues, not as the first sign thereof, as boldness is the first sign, Lord, but where you want us to walk in the gifts, I pray that they will also have the boldness to come to a leader to pray for them and get the breakthrough. I honor you for that, Father, and as we have communion, we want today, we want to say we celebrate the message of the cross. We celebrate what you've done for us through the cross. We will boast in nothing else except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the cross in Jesus' name.